Hi everybody! We are up to chapter 5 of Shaking the Nickel Bush. It is entitled Friendly Phoenix. Here we go. The same Mexican who had driven me out from Wickenburg drove me back, and though I think he was trying to be a little more careful, I was off the seat about as much as I was on it, and by the time we reached the town I felt as though I'd been through a dozen more horse falls. My legs were so wobbly when I got out at the depot that I walked as if I were drunk, and my bedroll seemed to weigh a ton. The only thing I could think of that I'd like to do was crawl into a soft bed and stay there for a month. But there was no sense in staying in Wickenburg, and Lonnie had said he'd wait a week for me in Phoenix, so I went to the depot to buy a ticket. It was only a little after nine o'clock when I went in, and I found that the next train didn't leave until four in the afternoon, and the ticket office didn't open until two. The seats in that depot were harder than rocks on horse fall sets, so after 10 or 15 minutes I tried walking around a little to see if I could loosen up the kinks in my back and legs. The first thing I saw when I went outside was a ramshackle old hotel across the street with a sign that read, Clean Rooms, One Dollar. I was lucky enough to get one on the ground floor so I didn't have to climb any stairs. It wasn't too dirty and the bed wasn't bad, but I couldn't get any rest on it. In the first place, there wasn't a spot on me that didn't hurt when I lay on it, and in the second place, the keeper for the bolt on the door was missing. When I'd come in there, there had been four or five rough-looking men loafing around the lobby of the hotel, and when I'd signed up for my room, the clerk had asked for my dollar in advance. I hadn't expected that when I'd gone in. A five-dollar bill was the smallest I'd had, and it was the outside bill on a roll in my pocket with an elastic band around it. The first thing I thought of was what Ted had told me about not flashing my roll, so I fiddled around with my fingers till I could slip the band off and peel the five. As I lay there trying to find a comfortable spot, I couldn't help thinking about the way I must have looked while I was fishing around in my pocket for that five. With my fingers as swollen and clumsy as they were, it had taken me a couple of minutes, and a man wouldn't have needed much brains to know that I was peeling a bill off a roll that was bigger than I dared to show. With no way of locking my door, and with me too stiffened up to fight back, it would be a cinch for those fellows in the lobby, or any one of them, to knock me for a loop and clean me out. I didn't have any use for $434, and if I'd had any sense, I would have left most of it with Ted so he could keep it for me until I saw him at the Littleton Roundup. But I didn't think of that. I wasn't really able to do much thinking during those last couple of days of fall riding, and I didn't try to keep any close track of what I was earning. Right at the beginning, I'd given Ted my mother's address and had told him to send her the money if anything happened to me. Then, when nothing did, I sort of had it in the back of my head that as soon as I got to town, I'd buy a money order at the post office and mail it to her in a letter. But as I lay there on the bed, I realized that I couldn't do that either. I'd already written her a big fairy tale about a job I didn't have and about having to use my next few paychecks to pay for my outfit. I should write within a couple weeks' time and send her $400, even she would have to think I'd robbed a bank or something of that kind. I wouldn't write and tell her about the horse falls because that would scare her to death. And I couldn't tell her I'd won it in a poker game because that would make her feel worse than if I told her about the riding in the horse falls. In fact, I couldn't write to her at all until my hands healed up enough that my writing wouldn't look like hen tracks. I don't know what I'd have done with my money if I hadn't, if I hadn't had to go to the outhouse, for I hadn't noticed till then how ripped up and dirty my britches were. It was partly to buy some new ones, but mostly to get away from the fellows in the whole hotel lobby that I went hunting for a dry goods store, and on the way I got an idea. When I went in and told the man I wanted the longest legs, smallest waisted pair of Levi's he had, mm -mm. when I went in, I told the man I wanted the longest legged, small, smallest waisted pair of Levi's he had. I was only 26 inches in the waist, but to get long enough legs, I had to take a pair of 32 36s. Even though I'd worn a company outfit when I was taking the falls, my shirt was nearly as messed up as my britches from practicing, and the man couldn't understand why I wouldn't buy a new one. But I didn't think it would be good business to look too preposterous, so I just asked him if he had a place where I could change britches. When I came out with those new Levi's on, I looked like, I looked more like a scarecrow than when I'd gone in. I had to take half a dozen tucks under my belt, and I'd had to make four folds in the bottoms of the legs before my feet would show. From the dry goods store, I went to a bank and bought eight $50 bills, the oldest and softest ones the teller could find. Then I asked them if they had a washroom I could use. They did, but I used it for only about two minutes, just long enough to unfold one leg of my Levi's, lay $420 against the bottom edge, and fold it up again. I was pretty sure I wouldn't need more than $14 for the next few days, and I was even sure that if anyone robbed me, he wouldn't steal my britches or think to look inside the folds of the cuffs. With the bills being old and soft, they wouldn't rustle, and no one could even feel them in there. 
That seven hours I had to wait in Wickenburg seemed like a week. Even when I didn't have to worry about being robbed, I couldn't rest comfortably on my bed, and it wasn't much more comfortable to hobble around the streets. I went to all three restaurants to see if them, any of them had stewed chicken or poached fish, but they didn't, so I bought a can of salmon and a quart of milk in a grocery store and took them back to my room. Then I went to the depot and bought my ticket just to kill time. While the agent was stamping on the back of it, I asked, Is the bow-legged freight conductor who runs between here and Phoenix due in this afternoon? Yep, yep, he told me. That'll be Jim Magee, and he ought to pull in long about three o'clock. How come you'd ask? He did me a good turn once, I said, and I just thought I'd like to say hello if I could find him again. You ain't alone, the agent told me as he took my two dollars and picked the change out of the till. Jim, he's got a soft spot for down-and-out cow hands, especially them that's kids and a long way from home. He didn't get them bow legs of his railroading. Didn't go to breaking freight till... 98, if I recollect right. Not till he was pretty well stove up. Time he was your age, he was the bronc peelinest cow hand in these parts. What did he, lend you a five? No, I said, he just did me a good turn when I needed it. If the agent hadn't asked me about the five, I'd have hung around the depot till the freight came in and then thanked Jim Magee again for bringing me out from Phoenix. But I got the idea that the old fellow must have lent many a five to boys who hadn't been as lucky as I, and who had never been able to come back and repay him. I walked up and down the platform three or four times just thinking about it, and the more I thought, the more I wanted to pay back the debt for one of those boys. But you couldn't walk up to a man like Jim Magee and hand him a five-dollar bill along with some goody-goody talk about wanting to pay somebody else's debt. There was only one thing I could think of to do, so I went up to the main street, bought a box of ten-cent cigars, and was leaning against the end of the depot when Jim's freight pulled in on the siding. I stayed where I was until the engine had been uncoupled, then started across the tracks. The old man recognized me before I was halfway to him and called out, Hi there, bub. See you done some riding and come out all in one piece. Do any good? Yup, I said. I was lucky, so I won't be needing that straw car. I'm just going to ride the cushions. Just came over to thank you for giving me a lift, and I brought along a few cigars I don't have any use for. That old one of yours looks kind of worn down. It looked as though the stump old Jim had clenched in his teeth was the same one he'd had when he brought me out from Phoenix. He took it out, tossed it away, and said, Now that was right kindly of you, but you needn't have fetched along no cigars. Most generally, the boys don't bother to come back less than they need another lift, and you already thanked me once. The cigar box wasn't wrapped. I guess Jim had thought there'd be only two or three in it. When he took it, he looked up quickly and said, Lord Almighty, a whole box full. You didn't go buy him, did you? I thought it would be better to tell him a white lie, so I just said, Side bet, and I don't smoke. Lord, Lord, he said as he looked the box over. Ten centers? Who'd you bet with, one of them Hollywood dudes? You must have done all right. Where are you heading for, California to see the sights? Most of the boys does when they make a stake. No, I told him, I'm going back to Phoenix. I've got a buddy waiting for me there at the stockyards. He's going to find us jobs with one of the drovers or cattlemen that brings stock in. Jim stood for a minute or two, looking down at the track and shaking his head slowly. Doubt me he'll do it, he said at last. Doubt me you'll find a job anywhere in a railroad town. Too many soldier boys coming back from the war that can't find nothing to do, swarming over the freights like a mess of ants. Most of the crews are kicking them off. I know it, I told him. My buddy and I got kicked off a dozen times between Tucson and Phoenix. Yup. Yup, he said. A man's taken a risk to haul him, likely to get laid off if a spotter catches him. He looked up and grinned. Was I bumming the railroads? I'd never bother with no freights. Blind baggage, that's the safe place for a man to travel. And the fast one. The mail trains will take a man further in one night than freights will in a week. I didn't even know there were mail trains, and I had no idea as to what blind baggage might be. When I told Jim I didn't, he looked up at me sort of questioningly. Take it you ain't been bumming long, he said. No, I told him, only to get from Tucson up here. He turned the cigar box over in his hands and looked down at it for a couple minutes. Then he said slowly, Well, I ain't recommending it to you. But if you was to get stuck bad and broke, it might be a good thing to know. Then he explained to me that the fast mail trains picked up and dropped off mail sacks on the fly and made stops only at large cities or division points. He said the first car behind the engine was called the blind baggage because the front door was locked tight and the train crew didn't have a key for it, so they couldn't get through to see if a bum was riding in the doorway. About all a man's got to do is flip one of them blind baggages after a train gets to rollin' right good, he told me, and he's all set to the next division point anyways maybe a couple of hundred miles down the line. Don't make no difference if the engine crew spots you flipping on. They ain't going to stop a train to kick you off, and they ain't risking a layoff if they got caught hauling you. I thanked him for telling me about the blind baggage, and was putting out my hand to shake with him and say goodbye when he looked up and said, 
know what I'd do if I was a young fella in these times and had made me a little steak and was hunting for a cowhand job? I'd buy me one of those second-hand flivvers. A man could pick a pretty good one up for about a hundred dollars, and I'd take off into the back country. Any man with a grain of sense will hire a hand that's got spunk enough to come hunting a job quicker, and he'll take one of them that's hanging around the railroad towns and the stockyards. Now you understand, bub, I ain't telling you what to do. I'm just telling you what I'd do if I was a young fella in times like of this. After I'd thanked him again, he stuck out his hand and said, If you're taking the four o'clock, you'd best go pick up your bedroll pretty soon. She's due in about six minutes. And if you get this way again, look me up. I reckon I'll be around quite a spell yet. It was long after dark when I reached Phoenix, so I didn't try to find Lonnie, but took a hotel room about a block up from the depot. Then I found a little restaurant where the owner did the cooking and his wife waited, waited on the counter. At first they thought I'd been beaten up in a fight, but when I told them about riding in the horse falls and about my diet, they were real friendly. They didn't have much I could eat, but the man opened a can of spinach, heated it, and put on three poached eggs. He said he'd get in some cabbage and celery the next day and he would stew me a chicken. Then his wife said that if I'd bring her the flour in mother's recipe, she'd make me some gluten bread. They were Swedish people, and I think they believed I was Swedish too because my hair was blonde and I had a New England accent. The room I got was a good one, in a nice clean little hotel and only a dollar a day. It was at the back of the ground floor and had a good bolt on the door, two large windows, and the best bed I'd slept in since I left home. Maybe it was just too good and I was just too tired. I went to sleep within two minutes after I crawled in, and I must have slept in the shape of a question mark. It was well after daylight when I woke up, and though I was warm enough, my back and hips were as stiff as if I'd been rolled into a ball and frozen. I wiggled around till I could get my legs over the side of the bed and sit up, but I could barely lean over far enough to get my legs into my britches or straighten up enough to pull them on. I had to fish for my boots with my feet, then lie down to haul them on. Anybody who saw me going over to breakfast must have thought I was the hunchback of Notre Dame. Those Swedish people at the little restaurant were as good as was were as good to me as if I'd been their own folks. Mr. Larson heated towels in the oven and put them on my back while I was eating. And after I'd finished, Mrs. Larson phoned their doctor and sent me up to his office. She must have phoned him again while I was on my way. When I got there, he knew all about my having ridden in the horse falls and about the diabetes in my diet. Before he checked me over at all, he made me tell him everything Dr. Gagan and my specialists had said and show him the diet list in my little book. Then he really did check me over. He stripped me as naked as a picked chicken, laid me out on a doctor's table, took my pulse, temperature, and blood pressure, and poked his hands into my belly as if he were kneading bread dough. Miraculous! Miraculous! He said three or four times as he poked at me. No rupture of the spleen. That liver seems normal. Kidly kidneys are not badly enlarged. Any tenderness there? How about there? Every part of me was tender, but there was no sharp pain, so I kept shaking my head, and he kept poking and saying, Miraculous. After he had me kneaded to putty, he put on his stethoscope and listened to my chest and heart. He picked a spot just above my wishbone and cocked his head like a robin listening for a worm. Hmm, he said, there's the damage. Considerable regurgitation. If that means a leaky heart, I told him. I've had it ever since I was ten. Know the cause, he asked. The doctor in Colorado said it was from riding too many rough horses, I said. Did he tell you to quit riding? Only the rough ones, I said. Then you know better than to go into any such escapade as this intentional falling. I had to do it, I told him. I was broke and couldn't find any other job. Huh, it's a wonder you weren't broken in two. What's your normal heartbeat? Forty-eight. Probably saved your life, he said. These slow hearts will stand more abuse than fast ones but you've done yours no good. I want you to take a full week of bed rest or at least confinement to your room. Of course, you can go out for meals, and I want to see you each day. After I've examined your specimen, I'll write a report to your doctor in the East. What's his name again and his address? Of course, I couldn't let him write to Dr. Gagan, and the only way I could keep him from it was by promising to do what he told me. I stayed in my room all day except when I went to eat, but it was one of the longest days I ever put in. He'd put some sort of plaster on my back that kept it from aching too much, but I was still bent over like a question mark, and I couldn't be comfortable either lying down or sitting up. Then, too, there was nothing but local news in the paper, and the magazine I bought only had one interesting story in it. I think I might have been a little bit homesick that day if it hadn't been for the Larsons. I didn't go to lunch till well past noontime, so I wouldn't be too much trouble to them, and when I got there, Mr. Larson had a chicken fricasseed for me, crisp celery stalks, and cabbage boiled with caraway seeds. Besides that, he'd got hold of some gluten flour, so Mrs. Larson copied down Mother's recipe and baked bread for me that afternoon. 
I think it would have been better than Mother's if she hadn't put in a big handful of caraway seeds, and of course I didn't tell her I disliked them. Even with the seeds, my supper that night was the best I'd had in a long, long time. There was hot bread and butter, more cabbage and celery, and a whole boiled fish. Excuse me, a broiled fish. Boiled fish doesn't sound good. I don't know what kind it was, but it was fresh and it was good. The next morning my back was a lot better and I could straighten up pretty well, but my legs were still so sift that, stiff that the muscles pulled at every step. After the doctor had smeared salve on my face and hands, he listened to my heart for three or four minutes, nodded, and said, A slight improvement already. A week of complete rest should repair the damage fairly well. I'd been worried about not letting Lonnie know I was back in Phoenix, and I thought I might be able to work some of the kinks out of my legs if I went to find him. So I told the doctor, I've got a buddy waiting for me down at the stockyards, and he'll be worried if I don't let him know I'm back in town. Would it be all right if I walked that far very slowly? Very slowly, he told me. This heart must have complete rest until nature has had time to repair it. Otherwise, you might be an invalid for the remainder of your life. I grinned and said, well, if the specialists were right, it won't be a very long drag. I don't know. I don't know, he said sort of questioningly. That specimen I examined yesterday wasn't as bad as I expected under the circumstances. I'm rather inclined to agree with your family physician. That is, if you behave yourself, stick rigidly to your diet, and get as much sunshine as you can on your body. Nature is a wonderful healer, and there is no better medicine than sunshine. I waited until I had my shirt back on, then gave him one of the report cards to fill out for Dr. Gagan, but I didn't leave it for him to mail. When I checked it with the copy of the one I'd made out for myself, I found them almost exactly alike, so I knew I couldn't have done myself too much damage in the horse falls. On my way to the stockyards, I poked along slowly, stopping to look at the old guns and pawn shop windows, or at anything else that would kill a little time, and I had one of the finest pieces of luck that I'd ever had in my life. In one of the windows, there were a dozen or so brightly painted water jars, and inside the dingy little shop, an old Mexican was shaping another on a potter's wheel. That m the minute I saw him, I knew I'd found exactly what I needed to take up my time during the week I'd have to stay in my room. All the time I'd worked at the munitions plant, I'd had a roommate who worked in the designing department. He was only a few years older than I, but before the war he had been, in, he had been one of the better sculptors in New York City and had taught in one of the art schools. The reason I'd moved in with him was because he'd seen me whittling a horse's head one noon after a bunch of us had eaten our lunches in the shade of a powder shed. Yvonne had been sitting five or six feet up the line from me, but when the man beside me got up, he came over and took the vacant place. He watched me for maybe ten minutes, then asked, "'Where did you learn that?' "'I didn't,' I told him. "'I've whittled horses ever since I was a little kid.' "'Ever model them in clay?' he asked. "'I've tried to,' I told him, "'but it's no good. With clay, the legs aren't strong enough to hold the bodies up.' "'Don't you know how to make an armature?' he asked. "'I don't even know what one is,' I said. "'If you'd like to come up to my room after supper, I'll show you,' he told me. While I was telling him I'd like to come, the whistle blew, so he scribbled down his address and room number on a card, and we both hurried back to our jobs. That evening, when I went hunting for the address, I found it to be one of the best apartment houses in Wilmington, with a beautiful lobby and an elevator. When I asked the elevator boy where I'd find the room number, he said, Oh, that's the artist, top floor in the rear. As I walked down the carpeted hall, I felt about as much out of place as a catfish in a goldfish bowl. I hadn't expected to find the man living in so fancy a place, so I hadn't bothered to put on my good suit before coming. Even after I'd reached the door, I had to stop a minute to decide whether to rap or to go back to my little eight-dollar-a-week room and put on my good suit. I was sure that any room in that building would be furnished like a palace, and I'd look just like a ninny coming in for in my old working clothes. I'd just made up my mind to go back and change when the door opened and Yvonne stood there in a dirty linen smock holding a letter in his hand. "'Oh, there you are,' he said. "'Go on in while I drop this letter down the chute. "'Should have sent it away last night. "'I couldn't have been more surprised "'if I'd stepped through a doorway "'and found myself on the moon. "'The floor, about 15 square feet, "'was covered with sheathing paper, "'splashed with plaster, "'and pockmarked with bits of stepped-on clay. "'Instead of the fancy furniture I'd expected, "'the room was bare except for a big work table in the center, "'a cluttered tool bench at one side, "'an easel, and a couple of plaster-spattered chairs.' Standing here and there were a dozen or so pedestals, some with plaster heads or busts on them, and some that were covered over with pieces of damp cloth. On a shelf under the work table were plaster hands, arms showing the, overla the overlapping and twisting muscles as though the skin had been peeled away, a broken foot, and three or four bass reliefs. I was still standing just inside the doorway looking around when Yvonne said from behind me, This is my shop. I live in the other room. 
Come, toss your hat into the bedroom, and we'll see what we can do about an armature. As Yvonne spoke, we walked part way down along the wall, and as he opened the door to a bedroom that was as spick, as span, spick and span as the shop was messy. There was a thick carpet on the floor, pictures on the walls, and all the furniture was dark, satiny mahogany. How good a shot are you? he asked as he pointed toward a post on the nearest twin bed. I don't go in from the shop without changing my clothes. Fortunately, I have another door from the hallway. I sailed my hat for the top of the bedpost, and I happened to have good luck. It lit like a horseshoe over a peg and spun around a couple of times without falling off. Good eye, Yvonne said. No wonder you can whittle a horse. Can you make them look like any special one? If people know the horse himself, I don't have to tell them which one I've whittled, I told him. Tie him up somewhere and use him for a model, he asked. No, I never tried that, I said. If I've known him well, I can remember what he looks like, and I guess I just kind of see him in my head. Good, good, he said. Now let's get at that armature. How big a horse do you want to make? That evening, Yvonne showed me how to twist the wires and make an armature for a horse a foot high. I never knew anyone except my own father, who was so patient. He didn't try to do it for me, just showed me how and let me do it by myself. And with all the horses I'd whittled, he told me something I'd never noticed, that the average horse is square, his body the same length as his height at the withers, with his forelegs, neck, and head each about half of that length. Before we started, he took a piece of charcoal, knelt, and with a few quick strokes, he sketched a rearing stallion on the floor. The armature is simply the skeleton, he told me as he drew a heavy black line that looped through the head, along the arch of the neck, curve at the back, and the length of the tail. There's the main stem, he said. Now we'll attach lighter wires to it and shape them into bones for the shoulders, hips, and legs. As he spoke, he drew the lines to show me exactly how the wires would be bent and shaped, so as to be hidden inside the clay and how those for the tail and hind legs would extend down to a wooden base to hold the framework firm and solid. <coughs> Pardon me. Then along the back, <clears throat> he sketched in a hanging wires with heavy crosses at their lower ends. <clears throat> those are wooden bats, he said, to support the weight of the body instead of ribs. The whole thing hadn't taken more than five minutes, but when he'd finished, I knew everything I'd need to know about armatures. Excuse me. <coughs> oh my goodness. The second evening, Yvonne showed me how to moisten the clay, work it pliable in my hands, lay it on the armature with the face of my thumb, and scrape it into the shapes I wanted with his tools. The third evening, he watched me as I finished the head and neck of my horse, making suggestions to help me here and there. Then when I was putting the damp cloth on it to keep it from drying out until I could come again, he asked, why don't you move in here with me? That would save you a long walk these evenings, and you could be quite a help to me with some tricky castings I'd like to make this winter. I'd like to, I told him, but I couldn't afford the rent. He asked me how much rent I was paying for my room, and when I told him, he said it wouldn't. He said it would cost me the same there. My eight dollars a week couldn't have been a quarter of what that apartment cost in wartime, but it was the nearest to a home I'd ever had away from home. And Yvonne taught me all that I had the ability to learn. By the end of the war, I'd made hundreds of horses and eight or ten portrait busts of friends I'd had at the plant. They didn't have the lifelike look that Yvonne's did, but anyone could tell whose portraits they were. My hands were itching for the feel of the clay again as I stood there on the sidewalk in Phoenix, watching the old Mexican build up the sides of his jar with his wet hands. I waited until the jar was finished, then went in and asked him what he'd charge me for a bucket of clay. He started off with a dollar, but I worked it down to sixty cents for the clay and an old bucket to carry it in. Then I told him I'd come back and get it within an hour. Lonnie wasn't at the stockyards when I got there, but I recognized a couple of the boys who were hanging around. One of them thought he might have hopped a freight back to Tucson, and the other thought he'd gone west, maybe to look for me at Wickenburg or to go on through to California for the winter. I told him where he could find me if he came back, then hunted around the yards for pieces of baling wire and sticks I could use for making armatures. I don't suppose that bucket of clay weighed more than 25 pounds, but with my back and legs and arms as lame as they were, it felt as though it weighed a ton before I got back to my hotel room. After I'd made another trip for a pair of pliers, I spread the tarpaulin from my bedroll on the floor and spent the rest of the morning twisting up an armature for a little horse, dampening my clay, and working it over to get out any particles of sand or grit. There is a clay horse. My fingers were too rough to do a good job of smoothing the clay, but I whittled myself little tools that worked real well, and that afternoon got away from me as though it had been only half an hour long. When I went over for my supper, I took the Larsons the horse I'd made, an old mare that we used to have when I was a boy, and anyone might have thought I'd brought them a present worth a hundred dollars. Of course, it was worthless in clay because it would crack and warp out of shape as soon as it dried, 
so I told them I'd take it back to my room and cast it in plaster of Paris. The rest of that week was fun. I made a horse for the doctor and another for the hotel keeper, and my plaster casts came out better than I expected. In Arizona, the plaster dried a lot faster than in Delaware, and the matrix chipped off cleaner. In the middle of the week, I sent Mother a money order for $50 with a long letter telling her that my boss had furnished me with an outfit, so I hadn't had to buy one and that he'd given me a raise in pay. Then I told her a long story about his sending me around to the back country to inspect his cattle herds and said I didn't know just where I'd be, but that I'd write often. The Larsons must have spent hours in finding things I could eat and cooking them for me. Even with the few things on my diet, every meal was different. Every one was enough for two men, and after I'd taken them the horse, they wouldn't let me pay them a penny. Each day I went to the doctor the first thing after breakfast, and each time he said my heart sounded a little better. Each day my back ached less, the stiffness drained out of my arms and legs, the black and blue spots faded, and the scabs began peeling off the scratches on my face and hands. I could have been happy to stay right there in Phoenix all winter, fussing with the clay and going over to Larson's for my meals, but of course I couldn't afford to do it. I told Mother I had a good job and could send her $50 a month, and my room was costing a dollar a day. I'd already told the Larsons that they couldn't feed me any longer for one little plaster horse, and I had no idea how big my doctor's bill might be. I was already down to $364, and if I didn't find some kind of job pretty soon, I'd go broke again. And that has been Chapter 5.